Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 680 for February 11th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. It's a very special year, and I suppose we want to do something to mark the beginning of our relationship with our new U.S. importer uh, in Bacardi. And uh, I suppose it starts a celebration for the year that we we're, we're christening uh, the Rise of the Phoenix, where our new make spirit from our new Dublin distillery uh, comes of age. Five years ago this past week, Jack Teeling and his brother Stephen filled their first bottle of Teeling Small Batch Irish Whiskey. Three years ago next month, they ran the stills for the first time at their new distillery in Dublin's Newmarket Square. And later this year, they'll bottle the first whiskey distilled in Dublin in more than four decades. This week, they also unveiled what may be one of the oldest Irish single malt whiskies ever, a 34-year-old single cask with only 38 bottles available. And since Valentine's Day is this week, we'll also talk about a match made in heaven, pairing whiskies with fine chocolate. R.M. Peluso's new book, Deep Tasting, Chocolate and Whiskey, looks at this divine combination and we'll explore the similarities between whiskey and chocolate later on WhiskeyCast In-Depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, and the what I'm tasting this week department all coming up on this week's WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Scotch whiskey exports set a new record high in 2017, according to statistics released on Friday by the UK's Revenue and Customs Office and the Scotch Whiskey Association. The global demand for Scotch whiskey led to an 8.9% gain in the value of Scotch exports over 2016 to just over $6 billion dollars while the volume of those exports grew just 1.6% to the equivalent of 1.23 billion bottles. While a weaker British pound likely contributed to some of those gains, Graham Littlejohn of the Scotch Whiskey Association credited some good old-fashioned hard work for most of the results. It's really uh, very heartening that uh, all the work that uh, Scotch whisky producers are putting in to get Scotch out to world markets is paying off now. Uh, that's not to say there aren't challenges. Of course there are. Brexit is a challenge. Non-tariff barriers are a challenge. Tariffs continue to be a challenge in several global markets. But these are really encouraging figures this year, and we're very pleased with them. We've reported on the so-called premiumization trend before, in which consumers trading up to buy more expensive whiskies instead of so-called value brands helps boost the value of whiskey sales while cutting into the volume. That trend clearly came through in one of the Scotch whiskey industry's biggest markets. France is traditionally the number one export market by volume by a wide margin and was not challenged for that spot in 2017. However, the volume of exports to France fell almost 6%, to 178 million bottles last year. But even with fewer bottles being shipped to France, the value of that whiskey rose by 2%, showing that even value-conscious French whiskey drinkers are starting to buy more expensive whiskies. The U.S. remains the number one single export market by value, but gained in both value and volume, each by more than 7%. However, the 27 European Union countries still make up the largest single regional export market, with nearly a third of all Scotch whiskey exports. Of course, Great Britain's exit from the European Union is just 13 months away now, and there is still no Brexit deal or free trade agreement in place yet. Graham Littlejohn and his colleagues at the SWA 
are trying to make sure that whatever framework the politicians come up with still gives the whiskey industry room for growth. We need to solve the transition uh, problem. We need to make sure that we're having a two to three year transition where the market conditions remain the same into the EU single market. As I've said, a very important region for Scotch whisky. Uh, almost a third of our global exports uh, go there. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got the, the, glo- the, the geographical indication protection for Scotch whisky. That's really important for us. And, and uh, I think uh, with the number of EU food and drink um, Uh, items which are protected by GIs and uh, the amount of UK GIs, that's an easy kind of trade-off. So we can uh, make sure that we have the the correct framework going forward for for geographical indication protection. And then looking externally, there are opportunities in in global trade for Scotch whisky. Uh, We can get the free trade agreements with India, China, these big markets of the future where we actually have a very low market share for Scotch whisky at the moment, just uh, just 1% in India, 0.1% in China. Even increasing these just very marginally will have a great impact on Scotch whisky exports going forward. The export figures also hint that Russia's thirst for Scotch whisky has not slowed down despite European Union trade sanctions. For the second straight year, Scotch whiskey exports to Latvia skyrocketed with a 75% increase in volume to 37 million bottles. Latvia's entire population is slightly less than 2 million people, which means the country imported enough Scotch whiskey last year to supply every single Latvian man, woman, and child with 19 bottles of whiskey during the year. Now, the UK's customs data only shows the first country an export shipment goes to, and Latvia has become increasingly important as a hub for shipping goods from the West into Russia. Graham Littlejohn of the SWA also points out, though, that some of those exports to Latvia might also have gone on to Estonia, which raised its excise taxes on alcohol last year. By the way, you can listen to my entire conversation with Graham Littlejohn, in the news section at whiskeycast.com. Scotland's Eden Mill Distillery plans to release its first single malt whiskey later this year, but founder Paul Miller is already focused on expansion. Eden Mill has submitted a plan to Fife Council to turn several former paper mill buildings on the University of St. Andrew's Eden campus in Guardbridge into a new distillery and brewery. The project would allow Eden Mill to expand both production and visitor traffic and could open this autumn if planning approval is granted soon. A setback for the Irish whiskey industry this week. Westmeath County Council has shot down plans for a whiskey maturation campus in Moivor. The council rejected Alan Wright's proposal to invest 138 million euros, that's about 169 million dollars, to build 12 maturation warehouses in what would have been Ireland's largest independent whiskey storage facility. The Westmeath Examiner reports council members said the warehouses would result in a visual scarring of the rural landscape and set an undesirable precedent because of their impact on a neighboring house. Wright already had commitments from three large global distillers to take up 80% of the space in those warehouses, and had planned to build a whiskey museum and interpretive center in the second phase of the project. And this isn't as much of a setback as it is a slap in the face. Campari Group CEO Bob kunse Kinsevitz is ruling out a return to the Irish whiskey business. Campari sold off its Irish Mist and Carolyn's Irish Cream brands last year to Heaven Hill, and he told JustDrinks.com this past week that he does not see a place for Campari in the fastest-growing segment of the global whiskey market. He cited the major investments in new distilleries that will be coming online in the next several years and said the world will be swimming in Irish whiskey when that happens. He also blasted the category for being, quote, one brand and a half and said he's very happy to be on the sidelines. The most vocal response came on Twitter from Louise McGuane of Chapel Gate Whiskey Company, who tweeted a link to the Just Drinks story and said, quoting now, Bob can shove it. In other news, we're getting the first details now on Glen Allocke's future under its new ownership team led by Billy Walker. 
The distillery will launch a core range of single malts ranging from 10 to 25 years old in June and has signed distribution deals in 12 countries with the goal of having 30 countries on board by June. Glen Allocky has also hired a marketing and sales team while managing to build a new filling store and two new dunnage warehouses at the distillery in the meantime. Pernod Ricard is making a number of executive changes with a big impact on the whiskey business. Chivas Brothers Chairman and CEO Laurent Lacassagne will be leaving the company. He's been in charge of Pernod Ricard's UK business since 2013. He'll be replaced by current Irish distillers Chairman and CEO Jean-Christophe Coutures, and Connor McQuaid will move to Dublin from his current post as Executive Vice President for Global Business Development at Pernod Ricard headquarters in Paris. Now, Kentucky's new law, allowing liquor stores and bars to legally buy and sell bottles of vintage whiskeys, took effect at the start of the year. And the first retailer specializing in vintage whiskeys has opened up in Lexington. Justin Thompson and Justin Sloan opened Justin's House of Bourbon this weekend, with current whiskeys alongside bourbons from the pre-Prohibition era up until a few years ago. The two Justins are also partners in the Bourbon Review magazine. Now, the state has not yet hammered out all of its regulations for vintage whiskey transactions, but is allowing deals for whiskeys that are no longer available from distributors. Meanwhile, the whiskey and investment worlds are colliding in a number of ways. In the UK, the rare whiskey auction market set a new record last year with more than 25 million pounds in sales. That's according to Andy Simpson and David Robertson at Rare Whiskey 101, which tracks the collector's market. Fourteen different distilleries had at least one bottle bring a high bid of 10,000 pounds or more last year. And another investment fund is opening up with a focus on whiskeys. The Single Malt Fund is based in Sweden and is only open to Swedish investors. Founder Christian Svantessen came up with the idea a couple of years ago during a trip to Isla and has spent the last six months putting the fund together. Technically speaking, it's called a participating debenture. People invest in our fund. And the capital that the fund has is then... Uh, later or consequently invested into whiskey in terms of liquids, um, the liquid gold, so to say. So that is the full plan. Uh, we invest, and uh, uh, to our help, of course, there are five people employed by the fund, experts, so to say, analytical people, uh, who know the industry very, very well. They are internationally uh, well reputed and renowned. Um, in fact, one of them being an American. And it's a range of, of uh, competence uh, with different experiences, different competences, but um, to describe them, they have a very broad and deep understanding, not only of whiskey um, as a liquid, so to say, they not only have good noses, uh, but they have a thorough understanding of the industry and uh, maybe more importantly, the market of, of whiskeys. Is the focus to buy current bottles and then hope they appreciate or to buy vintage bottles? Uh, where are you looking at this uh, in terms of uh, investment? Uh, the fund's focus is to buy limited uh, ranges of, of uh, whiskey. Uh, we have a global perspective, which means that we're not only looking at scotch, even though that is likely to be a majority of, of our investment focus, naturally. But we have a global uh, perspective when we invest. If that comes from Taiwan or Japan, Canada or even the U.S., um, that is that is uh, that is not the focus. So uh, it can basically be any any. Any whiskey, any single malt that is limited and that we believe will have a good appreciation. Svantessen could not name the whiskey experts on his investment board yet. He has contracts in place with three of the five members and is still working on contracts with the other two. He'll announce them after that. And once the fund launches, it will be publicly traded on Sweden's Nordic Growth Exchange. With the interest in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies these days, 
It shouldn't come as any surprise that there's one being floated with a tie to Scotch whiskey. North of Scotland Distilling Company owner Ricky Christie and a team of finance and tech entrepreneurs are creating Cask Coin. It's a cryptocurrency backed by maturing stocks of Scotch whiskey. Coin holders will actually own the casks of whiskey, with blockchain technology used to not only manage the value of the coins, but track the provenance of each cask as it matures and is bottled. It is still a bit of a blue sky project and not legally available yet to U.S. citizens or green card holders. We have posted a link, though, to the Cask Coin website if you'd like to find out more. Meanwhile, let's find out more about new whiskeys hitting the market this week. Glen Grant is bringing its new 15-year-old single malt to the U.S. this month. It was released last year in global travel retail, and the U.S. is the first domestic market to get it. Glen Grant's Robin Cooper gave me a preview of it this weekend. We're using first fill bourbon barrels, so we're getting quite a bit of extraction from the wood. You know, a lot of caramel, a lot of vanilla baking spices um we're bottling it at 100 proof so 50 percent abv so batch strength we're calling it because we believe that at 50 it just gives it that optimum you know aroma and flavor dennis malcolm our master distiller tried it at as high as 55 all the way down to 46 and at 50 percent it reached its peak That 50% ABV bottling strength also makes it the strongest Glen Grant regular distillery bottling on record. It'll carry a recommended retail price in the U.S. of $76.99 a bottle. I did receive a sample this week, and I'll have my tasting notes for it later on. The McAllen is kicking off a new range of annual releases under the Classic Cut moniker. The 2017 edition is matured in ex Oloroso sherry casks, and bottled at 58.7% ABV. It'll be available in North and South America, along with Europe and the Asia-Pacific region. No word on pricing. Glendronic is out with batch number 9 of its Grandeur 24-year-old single malt. It's been blended from ex-sherry casks filled in 1990, 1992, and 1993, and bottled at 48.7% ABV. 1,487 bottles will be available worldwide. No word on pricing. Glen Scotia is releasing two new whiskies at the World of Whiskies travel retail shops in UK airports, a 16-year-old single malt and the 1832 Campbellton peated single malt. That one will sell for £52 or about $72 a bottle, while the 16-year-old will sell for £75. That's about $104 a bottle. On the Irish whiskey front, Jameson has unveiled its annual St. Patrick's Day bottle. This year's bottle was designed by Irish illustrator Claudine O'Sullivan and photographer Leon Ward, along with British designer Alex Mellon. The label includes an NFC chip that will let consumers access special content on Jameson's website. It'll be available in 35 countries. The Dead Rabbit Bar in New York City has become a global icon over the last five years and has been dropping hints about having its own Irish whiskey for the last few months now. The official launch of the Dead Rabbit Irish Whiskey is this week. It's a joint venture between Dead Rabbit founders Sean Muldoon and Jack McGarry with Dublin's Quintessential Spirits, which owns the Dublin Liberties Distillery that is currently under construction. We'll have more details on this one next time around. And Ireland's Glendalough Distillery is changing up its range, with new whiskies joining the existing double-barrel bottling. There's a new 13-year-old single malt finished in Japanese Mizunara oak barrels, along with a new 7-year-old single malt that's finished in Porter beer barrels from a Dublin brewery. On that note, the Virginia Distillery Company has released its first brewer's batch Virginia Highland whiskey, It's a collaboration with Three Notched Brewing in Virginia, which created a special Wee Heavy beer to mature in the distillery's casks. Those casks were then used to finish the whiskey for 12 months. It'll be available in the Virginia State Stores later this month and at select Washington, D.C. retailers next month. The price tag, 
about $64 a bottle. And finally, if you follow me on social media, you can probably guess that I've been somewhat occupied this past week tweeting about last Sunday night's Super Bowl, which the Philadelphia Eagles won over the New England Patriots. I know, what does that have to do with whiskey? Well, watching the Super Bowl parade in Philadelphia Thursday, I noticed a few players with very familiar whiskey bottles on their buses heading down the parade route. It turns out Eagle Chris Long decided to give each of his teammates a bottle of Crown Royal with a specially embroidered bag to mark the occasion. And while some of those bottles didn't make it to the end of the parade route, the memories of that day will last forever. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park. If you're a member of Highland Park's Inner Circle, you just might be able to get your hands on the latest release in Highland Park's Keystones series. Yes, Nabi is named for the cliffs on Orkney's Atlantic coastline, and only 1,200 bottles will be available to Inner Circle members. A drawing will be held next Monday, the 19th, to pick those 1,200 lucky whiskey lovers. If you're not a member of the Inner Circle, the good news is you can join this week and still sign up for the drawing. It's free, and you can get all the details at highlandparkwhiskey.com. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. Just like a perfectly executed double play. Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. I love answering whiskey questions. And the other day, at Iconoclast on Twitter posted a photo of a bottle of Thomas H. Handy Sazerac Rye, along with this note. A present my father hid away that my mom just gave me. Any idea the year, sir? Well, first, don't call me sir, that was my father. But since Buffalo Trace does not put the release year on the antique collection bottles, the only way to tell on this one is by the ABV, since that does vary from year to year. I checked back in my tasting notes, and it turns out to be the 2016 edition, which was bottled at 63.1% ABV. And after I tweeted back the answer, I got this response from at Iconoclast. I knew you'd know. You are like a cooler, interactive Jim Murray on speed dial who always speaks positively. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the kind words. Last time around, we heard from Tullamore Dew's Tim Herlihy on the U.S. launch of the Caribbean rum cask finish. Saw this the other night on Twitter from Kevin Baker at Believable Baker. It's in Madison. I got a bottle, listened to Whiskey Cast on the drive home, and realized that I was maybe the first to buy it in the state. Not sure which Madison you're in, Kevin, but I'm glad you're listening. I teased the upcoming whiskey and chocolate discussion that's coming up in a few minutes, Saturday afternoon on Twitter, and Angie Ball at Sanjee B on Twitter fired back with this, Bugger that Valentine's rubbish, but whiskey and chocolate any day of the week has my attention, along with a thumbs up and a whiskey glass pair of emojis. It won't be long now, it's coming up soon, and in the meantime, if there's something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. Of course, we're always available on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This week's Your Voice is brought to you by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. 
Please drink responsibly. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. We'll be talking about whiskey and chocolate in just a few minutes. And there's a bourbon and chocolate dinner coming up this Thursday night, the 15th, at Addie's at the Woodford Inn in Versailles, Kentucky. The Kentucky Derby Museum in Louisville kicks off this year's Bourbon Masters Legends series with the Henderson family from Angel's Envy on Friday night. The Whiskey Social is coming up on the 21st at Starward Distillery in Melbourne, Australia. Julio's Liquors in Westboro, Massachusetts has its annual Go Whiskey Weekend the 23rd through the 25th. The Whiskey Show Old and Rare is in Glasgow, Scotland the 24th and 25th. And the Old City Whiskey Festival is on the 25th at Boyd's Jig and Reel Pub in Knoxville, Tennessee. Whiskey Live New York is February 28th, and Whiskey Live Washington, D.C. is on March 2nd. Finally, Dramfest 2018 is March 2nd through the 4th in Christchurch, New Zealand. Right now, we have 173 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival or a tasting coming up that you'd like to let whiskey lovers know about, just use the contact form on our website and let us know about it. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. In just a few minutes, we'll explore the pairing of whiskey and chocolate with the Reverend Dr. R. M. Peluso. But first, This was a big week, and 2018 is a big year for Ireland's Teeling family. The patriarch of the Teelings, John Teeling, will have his first whiskey from the Great Northern Distillery in Dundalk come of age later this year. And as he did when he founded Cooley Whiskey many years ago, Great Northern is focusing on bulk whiskey sales. After John sold Cooley to Beam at the end of 2011, His son Jack went into business with the Teeling Whiskey Company, and brother Stephen joined the business a few months later. This past week, they celebrated the fifth anniversary of the first bottling of their Teeling Small Batch Irish Whiskey, and the brothers will have the first mature spirit from their Dublin distillery later this year as well. Jack was in New York City the other night to launch one of the oldest Irish single malt whiskeys on record, Teeling's 34-year-old Vintage Reserve Single Malt, it was distilled back in 1983 at an unnamed Irish distillery. There are only 38 bottles at a recommended retail price of $5,000 each, and it'll only be available in the U.S., the largest single market for Irish whiskey in the world. To follow on to uh, a limited release we've had in Europe and the rest of the world uh, last year, which was of a 33 year old. Um, but uh, this is a very special year, and I suppose we want to do something to mark the beginning of our relationship with our new US importer uh, in Bacardi. And I uh, suppose well, it starts a celebration for the year that we were, were christening uh, the Wise of the Phoenix, where our new make spirit from our new Dublin distillery uh, comes of age um, and uh, uh, we're planning on, on releasing that at the latter half of 2018 but that won't get to the US for some time so we want to do something special specifically for the US. So when is the anniversary and when does it hit three years and when do you release it? At three years in a day or so or what? Well, uh, you know, uh, we're going to do two things. Um, uh, we started distilling back in March 2015, um, but we had to do some work in our visitor center. So so we actually distilled the first new spirit uh, in Dublin for over 40 years uh, back at the end of March 2015. Uh, we didn't fill the first load of barrels, though, until July 2015. Um, so it won't be until July of this year that it becomes three years out of day. Uh, we started off with um, single pot still, you know, the traditional Dublin mash bills to pay homage to the distillers who went before us. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we have two different releases planned of the single pot still. One is a special commemorative bottling 
um, of one of the first casts filled, uh, which will be uh, on a very, very limited quantity of we're, we're thinking around 250 balls at the moment. Um, we're going to retail that at a certain price. Um, but what we're going to do uh, with the proceeds, all profits from that release will go uh, back into the local charity here in Dublin, in Dublin in particular. Um, uh, so, so we give something back. Um, we will have a larger commercial release at the end of that year. Um, we've been playing around with lots of different casts and taking our inspiration of what we've done before about innovative cast maturation. Uh, to apply that to our first commercial level single pot still, uh, which will be coming out, we hope, in November in limited markets, primarily in the in the Irish market. Um, and again, that will be a limited first batch that we, we, we bought. Are you getting excited now as this stuff ages? Have you tasted it? And how does it taste? And are you getting excited? Yeah, well, you can't help but get excited. Like, I suppose this, this is... Uh, from vision to reality, um, um, you know, at the core of everything that we were, we're trying to do, um, and uh, core to what why we set up the company was to revive uh, distilling in the city of Dublin, and uh, you can meet the next year that comes of age until um, um, so, you know, I suppose that vision becomes a reality. Uh, we've been tasting it all the way along. Uh, we've produced a uh, very clean distillate from the start. We, we saw some very good casks. Um, um, and uh, the spirit is evolving. Will it be at its best in three years in the day? No, it will not. And I put my hand up, and I think we're fully aware of that, but uh, there's enough latent interest in, in tasting it uh, and experiencing it on this journey to, uh, you know, its best that uh, we want to release and get it out there so people can 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 join us on, on the, the journey and, uh, you know, taste what uh, Dublin whiskey is in the 21st century. You mentioned the uh, new partnership with Bacardi. We talked about that last fall. Part of that included funding for the uh, distillery expansion that uh, you guys have been working on. Where does that stand right now? Yeah, we've 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 expanded uh, the visitor experience um, um, quite a bit. We've we've moved all our offices out uh, to an old building behind, um, and we've got that completed, which will uh, enhance the visitor experience, particularly for people who come for events. Uh, we've been ramping up our distilling um, um, capacity as well in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a couple of extra mashes and so forth. So, so we have uh, um, quite a aggressive plan of ramping that up over the next while as well. So, so things are going on track. We are looking at buildings in new maturation warehouses, but uh, they are difficult to find locations for it. So that's an ongoing project. Um, we have one or two, let's say, uh, coals in the fire that hopefully will come up to fruition um, over the next 12 months or so. We should note that the building you guys moved the offices into was actually, if I remember correctly, it's right behind the distillery at the end of the street that goes along beside the distillery, and it's the old uh, Brabazon building where the Brabazon family ran its operations in Dublin, and you've named a couple of bottlings after them. That's that's correct. Yeah, look, it was it's a big, uh, you know, significant building that was brought back to life um, as part of the rejuvenation of, of the continued rejuvenation of, of the area of the city that we find ourselves in. Um, and uh, it just was seem fitting uh, when we were looking for, you know, new um, office space that we would move in there because it's, it ties very closely to our own. Um, story of revival, reviving our old family trademark in the city. So uh, to me, it was a, uh, it was made to be, um, and it's probably the closest office that we can actually have to the distillery. So you literally go out the back door of the distillery, and you're actually into our new office. So, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a, a nice place to work from, and uh, you know, it's great to see that area of Dublin, the Dublin deliveries, really uh, come back to life. We'll come back to, to life in, in in hopefully the right way as well. And that's something we focused on when I was at the distillery last October, and we've done a Whiskey Cast HD segment on it with you guys and uh, talked about it. But the whole Dublin whiskey scene has really, really revived itself over the last three years officially since you guys started distilling, but really over the last five to seven years as you were planning for this, but also as other distillers were coming back to life in the, in the area. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very exciting time. Um, Dublin... In, in, in my eyes, is the cradle of urban distilling, uh, whiskey distilling. So um, uh, it has all the provenance and heritage. And the last distillery in Dublin um, shut its doors in 1976. But, you know, it's been a foundation of the economy and the culture in the, in the city for hundreds of years. Employed many, many people. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, 
whiskey. The last gold medal for Irish whiskey was in the 19th century and was really driven by the Dublin distillery. So it has this very unique provenance and heritage and uh, it's only right um, now that we're back in a new gold era for Irish whiskey, um, the Dublin distilleries and Dublin whiskey can be part of that conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, I suppose we started back in 2012 and um, we, we said from, from day one we were going to do it and I suppose we paved the way for other people to follow um, and, you know, there's a lot of exciting plans um, and obviously new new distilleries and business centres popping up all, all, all around us. But, uh, uh, you know, the, I think in, in this stage of evolution of the category, if people do it the right way and, 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 and forge their own identity, there's, there's plenty of room for all of us. If you'd like to get a look at the Teeling Distillery, it's part of our recent WhiskeyCast HD video podcast on the rebirth of distilling in Dublin. You can watch it on YouTube, iTunes, and at WhiskeyCast.com. Now, with Valentine's Day coming up this week, a lot of people are thinking, maybe even obsessing, about chocolate. Formal whiskey and chocolate pairing sessions are becoming more popular, but many whiskey lovers have been putting the two together for years. The Reverend Dr. R. M. Peluso is an interfaith minister and author, her first book, Deep Tasting, A Chocolate Lover's Guide to Meditation, explored the idea of mindfully tasting chocolates. Now, her new book, Deep Tasting Chocolate and Whiskey, puts two of my favorite treats together. And she joined me on the phone this week from her home in New York City. Let's start off by looking at the similarities here, because I think a lot of people who love whiskey would not realize that chocolate is also distilled and fermented to a certain degree, right? Well, not distilled, but fermented, yes. The beans are fermented. Once they harvest the beans, they have to be placed in, uh, in these um, wood containers. By the way, I, I was only recently querying my colleagues about what kind of wood they're using. And that's a whole other topic because I became fascinated because of my interest in whiskey. But uh, yes, so they're placed in these um, uh, wood containers and then they ferment uh, up to about a week. Um, and uh, by the way, there is some alcohol produced at that time and that had been used in eras past, uh, not so much these days, but in the past um, in Mesoamerica. Um, and then they are dried. Uh, they usually sit out on patios under the sun and they dry. And then they are, of course, packed and shipped. And things can go wrong at any point. <laughs> it's a very fragile kind of situation with cocoa beans. Sort of like with whiskey. There's a lot of places where you can have a problem in the process along the way. There are a lot of similarities here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, especially in terms of complexity and taste and flavor and aroma, there are a lot of similarities, yeah. uh, besides the fact that they generally go really well together. You actually can sort of evaluate chocolate and whiskey in much the same way. Yes. Yes. Exactly. In terms of evaluating it on the, the aroma, the yes. nose, the flavor, the finish, in terms of the same characteristics, if not necessarily the same flavors... Well, that's absolutely true, and um, that's why uh, it, it came so natural to me to go from chocolate to whiskey. How did you make that transition? <laughs> well, do you mean why or how? Both. <laughs> why and how? A little bit of a difference. Okay, well, well, I, I was seeing a lot of people doing pairing and I thought they were not doing it particularly methodically or, or very convincingly or well. And a lot of times, you know, you, you pick up a book. It can be um, a cookbook. It could be a book on whiskey. It could be a book on cheese. It can be a book on chocolate. And they do these, lay out these pairing suggestions and leave um, most of the readers clueless except for very concrete examples because they are not operating with any principles, you see. They're not laying out any principles, I should say. And um, so I, I wanted to do something more systematic, and I had the background to be able to do that kind of thing. And explain, what was your background with chocolate? How did you become a, a chocolate guru? Oh, <laughs> that's quite a story in itself. 
and I cover it in my first book. I had been very interested in wine uh, in the 1970s, and then I developed this uh, sulfite allergy, and I had to stop drinking wine. And um, but it had been such a wonderful experience for me, you know, uh, um, the savoring and the uh, analysis and the taking apart what the flavors were and, and enjoying them all together and so on. It was just the incredible sensory immersion that I loved. And um, I never realized how I was missing that because when I stopped drinking wine, I just simply stopped drinking wine. But then in the um, about 12 years ago, uh, I, I became interested in, it must be more than that now, actually, I became interested in chocolate um, and I happened to go to some shows and I was walking around and I realized that I had a slight knack for it for being able to pick out flavors and so on. So I, without no, realizing it, my skills from tasting uh, wine had translated. So I spent a good 10, 12 years reviewing chocolate for the C-Spot, which is cspot.com, and um, I still do a, an occasional review for them. And uh, then I, I wrote a book, um, my first book about it. And then I saw... A lot of people doing, you know, not a very good job of pairing, and I decided that I w would um, get involved with that, and I started to translate some of those tasting skills over to whiskey. And why whiskey? If you were allergic to wine and you got into right. whiskey, explain the, uh, the attraction that chocolate and whiskey have when you put them together. Well, first of all... Um, People were doing a lot with wine, uh, and and it was not a very good thing uh, because there there's a lot of clashes that occur between and with the tannins and so on with wine and chocolate. It's, it's it's quite tricky to put them together, and it became very clear to me that spirits were a more interesting way to go. I thought that whiskey had been underserved at the time in that area. So um, I started to learn as much as I could about whiskey. And when we're talking about chocolate here, we're not talking about Hershey bars. We're talking about the good stuff, right? No. <laughs> right. We're talking about craft chocolate, sometimes called artisan chocolate. And these are premium chocolates. These are small batch chocolates. These are made with loving care. They are sourced uh, for the most part ethically. Most of the companies start off very small and they're doing what's called micro batches and then they may build their business up. But um, there's a great care that is given to the entire process with a great respect for the cocoa beans and what they can do. Now, a lot of the commercial chocolates are sourced, about 70% in fact are sourced from places like the Ivory Coast and Ghana and so on. And they come along with a lot of ethical problems. I'm sure you're aware of worker exploitation and a lot of the um, news items um, that have come out of that area. But also, for the most part, these are not very interesting cacaos. They're commodity cacaos rather than full, um, fine flavor cacaos. But all around the world, people are producing now fine flavor cacaos. And in fact, some very exciting cacaos coming out of Vietnam, um, Malaysia, <laughs> uh, all over. But predominantly, South America, Central America are producing. Uh, very fine flavor cacao. Why does this sound really familiar mm. in whiskey terms with craft mm -hmm. distilling, artisan distilling, yes. small scale distilling? A lot of similarities here. The um, small craft distilling movement came about just around the same time as the fine artisan chocolate started to arise. So let's start talking about some pairings. Yes. Here. If I'm if I'm yeah. trying to host some friends, say, Valentine's night this coming week, yeah. and we want to put some whiskey and chocolate together, what would you recommend for a couple of good basic pairings, say, with a bourbon, oh, God. a single well, malt, all, and then one whiskey of your choice? In my book, what would you do? Uh, which is um, deep tasting chocolate and whiskey. I have over 140 superior pairings. And so the 
best thing people can do is pick up my book and, and look for a whiskey that they like and find compatible chocolates with it. I will just say that's the easiest way to do that. I, just let me explain one thing, what I mean by superior pairings. When I went about my research, I was looking at, at that time, uh, over 100 chocolate bars from various countries, many of them from the same countries, but in the hands of different artisan chocolate makers, it comes out differently. And also from harvest to harvest, it will come out differently. And then I was looking also at over 70 at the time. I'm way, way <laughs> beyond that now in my data collection, um, whiskeys. And I was looking at bourbons and, and scotch and whiskeys from all over. And then I was looking at which ones tended to go best. One of my pages, it's the most versatile chocolates, the most ver least versatile ones that are harder to match and so on. So if you happen to, to see that in my book, you'll realize that, well, if you want a smoky kind of um, scotch, something like Lafrog or um, Lagavulin or something like that, or a peat monster, you know, you, you want to go for something that ha has a spicy and herbal kind of flavor profile in a chocolate. It's not so simple as if it's a very sweet chocolate, then it will go with, um, you know, a smoky. Uh, it, it's really about the flavor profiles themselves. And, and the same token, you want to stay away from something like white chocolate, which is just beastly when it comes to uh, a peated uh, whiskey, in, in my experience. When you get to other kinds of whiskeys, bourbons, for example, they can be quite versatile. A number of uh, chocolates will go with them. I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but uh, that's what we do. <laughs> that's okay. But I just want to say that, you know, Valentine's, I just want to wish everyone a happy Valentine's and you too. Happy Valentine's to you, uh, Mark. And I think that until now, people have been thinking about Valentine's in terms of just chocolate, sometimes wine, you know, but whiskey has not really been such a big deal uh, when it comes to Valentine's Day. And the thing is that, you see, men have been very left out of the gifting equation. And we, when you think of most gifts that are given at Valentine's Day, it's usually roses or chocolates or jewelry, and it's usually for women, you see. But I feel that when we work with whiskey and chocolate, there's an opportunity here for a couple to really have an ex a shared experience that is very sensual and fun that involves two things that they're probably going to like. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with women getting whiskey as a gift. Oh, absolutely not. You know, I mean, as Fred Minnick has shown in his book, and that women have figured in very important ways in the development of the whiskey industry, both in England and Scotland, rather, and, um, and here in the States. So um, I think it's, women are underestimated, and I think a lot of that has to do with advertising, which tends to exploit women and to sell whiskey to men. But I think that's hopefully will be changing. But I think that if you have chocolate and whiskey together, I think that you're going to find an experience that may appeal to both genders. And also, I don't mean to just keep this on a heterosexual level. I think that any couple might find that someone might like chocolate more than whiskey and so on. And it, it's um, a common uh, a thing in common now to, to share the chocolate and whiskey. Very good point. We got the bourbon, we got one single malt, then pick one more. You want something that's sherry, like... Um, oh, sure, why not? Let's go for it. Well, let's take um, the Dalmore 12. It goes very nicely with um, Madagascar because of the high citrusy values. And uh, Patrick is um, a producer, chocolate maker. Their Madagascar 67 works very well with that. So does some of the um, Maru, which is a Vietnam producer. Also, some Dominican Republic uh, chocolates um, will go nicely with it. 
I know I've been in some of Richard Patterson's tastings where he will talk about the Dalmore 12 and other Dalmores and say, mm. try this with dark chocolate, at least 70% cocoa, and try it with a little bit of dark chocolate. He will recommend that heavy dark chocolate with the high levels of cocoa mm-hmm. in it. So it's not the first time I've heard chocolate mentioned in connection with the Dalmore. Well, that's because the Dalmore does have some chocolate notes. In fact, some of your scotches, some of your single malts do have chocolate notes, including uh, Westland the, here in the States. Anyway, so now you have an idea of uh, a Dalmore and, um, you know, Buch Laddie, they have uh, the classic Laddie. That has some caramel notes and candied citrus and so on. And and that went well with um, Jen Gang, 80% by Maru, the Vietnam producer. If you have listeners in the UK, uh, the Pump Street Granada 70% worked very well. And if you're in Canada, <laughs> the Soma chocolate maker, CBS Chama, 70% uh, works nice. What's your personal favorite chocolate and whiskey pairing? The one that you have is your go-to. Oh, well, that's very interesting because it changes all the time. Whenever people ask me this question, I always say, you know, I would never tell you the name of my love, and I would never tell you the name of my favorite chocolate. So it's very personal, but um, I do find that it changes, and there are times that I feel like having a smoky uh, or a peaty um, scotch, um, and then there are times when I feel like having um, a bourbon, and times that I like a Japanese blend. I love Irish whiskey, by the way. I'm always in a different mood. And lately, I've been really loving uh, Canadian whiskey. I I just find it so finessed in many respects, delicate, balanced. And it's very, very interesting whiskey that uh, is very underappreciated in this country. So what would you pair with a Canadian whiskey, that uh, the Soma chocolate from Ah. from, uh, Canada? Well, you know, when I was doing my book, I wanted to make things accessible and easy for people to find. So I looked at some of the Canadian chocolate makers as well to go with some of the Canadian whiskeys. So um, what I found was um, there's some excellent, excellent chocolate makers in Canada also. Uh, Soma, Palais de Bain, de Bain is another, um, Hummingbird. They make wonderful chocolates. So what I found was, for example, Caribou Crossing, which is a very interesting whiskey because it's Canadian made, but it's blended here in the States with Cesarac. Um, uh, Drew Maisel does the blending there. It's very hard. You know, I think it's Canadian or and American. I think it was binational from that standpoint. But I pair that with Hummingbird Copan from Honduras. Seventy percent, and Soma CSB Chama from Venezuela, seventy percent, and then I looked also at um, Lot Forty. It went very well with Dandelion Zorzal, Dominican Republic, seventy percent. So there you are. You'll find a link to RM Peluso's website in the show notes for this week's episode at whiskeycast.com. And I have to admit that while I love good dark chocolate, my secret vice is for Cadbury's Dairy Milk Chocolate Bars. Not the crappy Hershey-made U.S. version, but the real thing. The bars sold in Great Britain and Ireland and some places in Canada that are not available here. I always leave some room in my carry-on to bring a few home when I'm traveling. That's this week's Whiskey Cast in depth, brought to you by Lagavulin. It's also the real thing, with that classic Isla flavor that makes you dream about being on the shores of Lagavulin Bay with a dram in your hand. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with the new Glen Grant 15 year old I mentioned earlier during the news. It's matured in First Fill X bourbon barrels and bottled at 50% ABV. The nose has notes of tangerines, clementine oranges, and hints of toffee, vanilla, and almond oil. 
The taste has good spicy touches of white pepper and ginger that are balanced well by candied fruits, vanilla, honey, and a hint of caramel. The finish is long and smooth with notes of pears, red apples, oak, and almonds. I've never had a bad dram yet from Glen Grant, and I'm giving the new 15-year-old a 92. Last time around, we had the details on Glen Morangy's latest private edition release. Spios is matured in X rye whiskey casks and bottled at 46% ABV with no age statement. The nose has notes of black cherries, a hint of clove, nutmeg, herbal touches of basil and thyme, and a bit of freshly cut grass clippings. The taste is thick and spicy with clove, cinnamon, and nutmeg, along with the sweetness of buttercream cake frosting underneath. The finish is long with gently fading spices, a touch of toffee, and a hint of candied orange slices. It's a good solid whiskey, and I'm scoring the Glenmorangie Spios a 92. More tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, makers of Whiskey Advocates 2017 Whiskey of the Year, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. The 12-year-old Barrel Proof bourbon was pitted blind against competition from around the globe and was consistently ranked number one by the magazine's testers. Meet the whole Elijah Craig family at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. I received a sample the other day of Glen Murray's Elgin Classic Sherry Cask finish. This Speyside single malt is bottled at 40% ABV, and the nose is fruity with notes of apricots, peaches, red apples, and touches of figs and toffee in the background. The taste has a thick, oily mouthfeel with a good balance of fruitiness and spices. Apricots, peaches, and apples are complemented nicely by ginger and white pepper spices, with touches of toffee and figs in the background that pull it all together. The finish is long, dry, and spicy with a good underlying fruitiness. This whiskey has a great complexity and balance, and I'm giving the Glen Murray Elgin Classic Sherry Cask finish a 93. Now, my battle with the flu the last couple of weeks means I'm still working through some of the samples I brought home from last month's Victoria Whiskey Festival. The folks at Willow Park Wines and Spirits in Alberta and Saskatchewan got their hands on a single cask bottling from the Glenrothes. It's a 12-year-old cask that was filled in 2005 and bottled in 2017. And hold on to your toques. It was bottled at 66.7% ABV. The nose is slightly dry and dusty with the usual Glenrothes notes of dried fruits, orange blossom honey, crystallized ginger, and a touch of black tea. That extra bottling strength makes a big difference on the palate. It's intense with amped up notes of dried apricots, apple slices, and orange peel, balanced by honey, crystallized ginger, black tea, and a hint of clove. The finish is very long and smooth with a nice, complex balance of fruit, spices, and just a subtle hint of oak. I'm scoring the Glenrothes 2005 single cask bottling for Willow Park Wines and Spirits a 93. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,100 whiskeys from around the world at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can find links to our WhiskeyCast tasting panel and WhiskeyCast HD podcasts, the latest whiskey news, events, and much more, including a complete archive of our past episodes. If you haven't done it yet, I hope you'll take a minute this week and leave a review for WhiskeyCast at Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts from. Reviews and ratings do get figured into the search engine results that can help other whiskey lovers discover the show when they're looking for new podcasts. Of course, that cask strength conversation continues all week long online. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. My email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. 
Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.